As someone who's really into sports, one of my favorite things is when they have the highlights of the month. They kind of just show you snippets, some of the really cool things that you've seen. And what we're going to do this year is that every month we're going to share some of the highlights of the month. And I had so many great guests uh, interviewed in this last week doing the three question series, which, you know, people are really appreciating talking about like, who's your favorite teacher, you know, talking about your favorite men, what advice you'd give to yourself and some of the longer podcasts. So what you're about to listen to or watch is actually some of the highlights from the month. And I'm still getting the video down, the audio down, still trying to get this. So it's a much better product for, you know, those who are viewing or listening, but it doesn't take away from the awesome advice, the awesome stories that our guests have. And we just wanted to package them together so you can get a range of different ideas. So I hope you enjoy uh, January's highlights from the Innovators Mindset podcast. It's an offshoot similar to Myers-Briggs, but it's a shorter survey mm -hmm. called the True Color Survey. It's from Ketterman from 1972. And um, and I've been using it forever. It's a, you can find it on the internet. It's a paper survey. So I often, I give this survey, it splits kids into four colors or, or not just students, but anybody can take it. My own children have my husband, right? So you're either a gold, green, blue, or, or an orange. And depending on those, um, it, then aligns with a bit about who you are, your learning style, um, and how you gravitate maybe towards people or learning or understanding. Um, and what I help students do is we, we take it. So I've digitized the form. You can download it off of the website. And I've also given educators who want to implement it, whether it be with staff or with students, a way to actually use the data. So they can download it, they can use it, and then there are activities and things that you can do because the stuff that I actually really dislike and I, you know, I tend to approach things really positively, but I dislike when we do all of these like opening things and like getting to know you stuff and then it just disappears. Like that for me feels meaningless. And if we're going to do something where we're actually connecting with people, I want it to be a value. So what I tried to do was support with like, what are activities? What are things that you can do um, at, at every unit, at every unit break for teams to get to know each other that is rooted in this initial piece. So I use it when I'm building groups. I help to build balanced teams. I have students reflect on why they're in that group, how they bring value to the team, how they would like to be approached, how they want other students to approach them, um, the way to actually listen and learn from each other. Like it informs all of our practices. We analyze literature based on it. The science teachers that I work with analyze, like one of them is a chemistry teacher and she has the students analyze the colors of the elements, right? So like just starting to look at, okay, is this, is this um, a more social element? Does it like to attach on to others, right? Um, or is it someone that, that need, is it an element that like structure? So, right. It aligns itself with these personality types. Um, and then that's brought me to building out these kind of growth challenges that are by month, um, to help both students and anybody else using it to really think about it, ways of growth. So when I talked about my boss, Patrick, who like talked to me about an area of growth, like, I think we often need a way to know what are ways where we can get better? It doesn't mean that what we have is a fault. It just means what can I learn from the other learning styles or personality types that can help me be a stronger, more connected, more collaborative individual, right? Like, and so how can I learn from others to be my best self? How do you see that notion of growth mindset when you're talking about a student, like, like I, I made the analogy um, when we were talking before, there's pretty much nothing you could have done to get me interested in science. And science is just, and I'm okay saying this, it's not my thing and I'm fine with it being other people's things, but there's lots of things that I do very well. There's lots of things I'm really interested in. So how do you see that connected when it's really hard to see a student maybe just doesn't have a passion for what you have a passion for? There's so much to be said about that. I could talk for hours, but I think all in what you're saying, there's a couple of things. I think the first thing you're saying is that you had people who were just preaching and throwing around the word saying, mm -hmm. you got to have a growth mindset. Well, okay. There's one thing saying it. And then there's another thing doing it and living it and actually 
being a, a solid model for it. And there's also something about making relationships and connections. I mean, if I'm throwing around words like growth mindset and saying, Hey, you have to have a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't really think, I think I'm missing the ball because I don't really know my, understand my relationship with that person well enough. And I'm not leading in something the right way. This, the second thing I would say, I would go back to as well is it's more than just the growth mindset. It's not just the growth mindset mm -hmm. is yes, that's a piece of it. And the growth mindset, the ability, you know, the, the belief in that abilities can be cultivated is a truth. Yes, mm -hmm. they can. They can be cultivated. We have to find that way to cultivate them. And it might not be that they're passionate about the topic, but do we know their story? Do Have we given kids the, the opportunity to know their story? I mean, education is, is, you know, one foot in the past and the other foot in the future. And... We're just kind of in the, are we in the middle? Which end of it of that are we close to? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's this whole part of emotional learning that we've really dropped the ball on. And I mean, I didn't ever talk about feelings when I was in school. I didn't really, I, I didn't have a chance to sit down and actually just have my teacher kind of kick back and be like, hey, how are you doing? I, mean, I don't think, I don't remember that a lot. And I think that now that we've had a pandemic to finally say here, and especially in America, I'm not, I, and I believe as well in, in Canada, and I'd say across North America, we finally are saying, hey, mental health matters. Mm -hmm. Hey, we can talk about feelings now. I think the issue is that it, the reason that people don't have a, gro a growth mindset is because they've lost something somewhere or perhaps that they just stop believing in that. And maybe they just don't understand their feelings. A lot of people think of UDL as like something you do as a, like a list of strategies. And it's far more about like a set of beliefs or a set of principles. And with UDL, there's like three kind of core principles that have never changed. So universal design for learning has been around for 30, almost 40 years. And during that time, the strategies have continually evolved. Um, you know, the technologies have evolved, the strategies have evolved, um, just as the evidence base gets bigger and we learn more about the importance of, you know, critical thinking and the innovator's mindset. Um, what has never changed is the core belief. Um, and that is number one, that we have to embrace this concept of variability, that like people aren't static. Like they need different things at different times. And the traditional model of education was really focused on like, once you know a learner, you know what they need. Mm -hmm. And you can like slap a label on them like a price tag and then you'll know about them. And so like a really concrete example is like, you would say, I'm a strong reader. You could hand me a piece of text, I could read it. Um, but if I don't have my contacts in, I can't read it. And if I have a migraine, I can't read it. And that just shows like learning is contextual. And so when we embrace the concept that not only are learners different from each other, but they're actually very different day to day based on their mood, we have to design something where learners get to create their own environment. That's the first thing is like, we can't possibly know what everybody needs more than they know that themselves. So number one is like just this concept of variability means we can't possibly ask everybody to do something in the same way at the same time. Um, the next is this concept of like really firm goals and flexible means. So like, what is it that we actually want students to know and do? And let's strip all the crap away from that. Like all the things that are standardized, all the things that are one size fits all, because we have like these really, really open standards. Like students will explain the causes of the civil war, for example. And then it's like, you got to read this chapter of the textbook. You got to take this right. multiple choice test. You have no idea if kids can explain the causes of a civil war, if that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be really flexible about like, what really is the goal? And then based on variability, how do we cr provide like multiple pathways for, these are all the ways you can learn about the cause of the civil war. Here's materials that you can use if you get stuck. Here's materials you can use if you want an extra challenge. Here's all the ways you can share what you know. And that requires all those pieces of that innovator's mindset, which is like, I have to be reflective. You know, I have to be self-directed, you know, all of that work. And then the third belief is that there's value in expert learning. There's value in putting the learner in the driver's seat to make those choices. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very different model because like in a traditional setting, it's like, I am in charge. I look at the goals. I decide how everyone's going to learn it, the materials they need and how they're going to share what they know. But that doesn't embrace variability. 
it doesn't build expert learning. And it's not the only way to meet the goals that we're required to build. And so when you think about UDL in this new landscape, which is very flexible, you know, a lot of people are like, okay, we were in person and now we're remote or hybrid, but then we're going to go back to in person. Eh, False. We're not. Okay. It's always going to go back and forth. Like, why would you call snow days? Why would you continue to have school if 20% of your kids had the stomach flu? Mm. You know, I think that we're going to have to be ready to evolve. And so in doing that, we have to design learning where we say, how do we design a collection of resources that can be accessed in the cloud? We all look back at our teaching career, look back in education and there's things that we wish we could have done. You know, we all probably want to send those apology letters to the kids we have in our first year, you know, thinking about what we know now. And so we've grown a lot in the profession. So if you were to go back in time and at the beginning of the career with everything that you know now, what advice would you give to yourself in that first year? Immediately chill out, <laughs> chill out. It's going to be okay. Tomorrow's going to come. You're going to do fine. You make a mistake. Don't worry about it. Adjust, pivot and move on. You'll be fine. Your kids are going to be fine. They truly are. Um, focused on relationships and just chill out. Like I was so uptight and so stressed um, that I don't remember much. I remember my interactions with a lot with my students, but man, I was just so uptight outside of school. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Truly was. So I would say just chill out, relax. It's going to be okay. That's that. That is one of the things that we talk about with every single author. We give them the manifesto speech. Yeah. And we say, listen. Like we, M, the, there's an acronym. The M stands for manifesto. We want you to write your manifesto. We want you to write the core message that you want to share with other educators in the world. Like if you could give a TED talk next week, this would be your TED talk. Like we want your TED talk speech, right? If you could give a keynote at the biggest conference in the nation, like this would be your keynote topic. This is the kind of thing that after you're done giving it, you would just want to like slam the mic down and break it because who the heck's going to step on the stage after what you just said? You just crushed it. But then here's the problem is that, um, we think that writers have to go almost over the top in their writing to have that same sort of emotional impact as a writer they do as a speaker. Because like if I sat down and had a meal with you, certainly not after ASCD, but if I sat down and had a meal with you and you told me about your work, um, like I would be able to see your facial expressions, your intonation, uh, the, the inflection in your voice. Maybe you would gesture if you got excited about a point you were making. But then the, that same person could be so passionate about their, their work, will sit down at a computer and now all of a sudden they feel it has to be real formal, professional, academic, because the book always has to be so serious. It has to fit into this little formula and recipe and all that. And we just like toss that away and say like, no, like this is like, we want you to take all of your best stuff from when you're speaking, from your blogging, all this stuff and, and, and wrap it together and create your manifesto. Now manifesto gets a bad rap in the world mm-hmm. as a word, because when you usually hear it, it's when a serial killer leaves one behind. Right. You know, like they'll say they killed 10 people and left the manifesto in the basement or something like that. But we look at it in a positive sense. Like this is your legacy. This is your moment. Like nobody likes lukewarm. So you don't even have to shave off the edges of your of uh, uh, the right, like the roughness of your message. You don't have to fit into any particular box. We just want you to share your voice and, and we're going to try to amplify it for you. I'm going to ask you about this. So this is the last part you write in your very first blog. Uh, so in short, I'm very excited to start actually writing down my reflections regarding all of this. I love how you put this quotations, innovation, and education, <laughs> I love that it's in quotations talk instead of just spending countless, countless hours at night trying to sleep while my brain processes all of these cool new things that I'm learning and implementing in my class. I'm not sure what this blog will end up looking like, nor do I know how often I'll be posting, but I'm here now and that's already a great thing. And I love all of this, but I'm going to ask you, um, So like shifting from, I think this is a 2016 from, yeah, September 18, 2016. So you talked about like, hey, look at all these cool things. Like there's so many cool things, but now, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but like, are are you looking at all these cool new things or do you, do you try to focus on all of these things? Do you try to focus on a couple of things? So like in that one, I think you're looking at like, how do I implement all of these different things comparatively to now? Like, is it the same approach? Do you think differently about that? You know, about innovation and education. <laughs> yeah. Quotations. 
that definitely has shifted, you know, like at the yeah. very beginning, it was like, here's all the things that I'm learning about. And here is how I think it could fit into my classroom, or here are things that I'm trying. Whereas now it's more like, I'll read something that will spark an idea that will become a whole blog post. It's not necessarily something that I'm working through to then figure out how I'm going to do it in my classroom. It's something that I read that kind of ties things together that I've been thinking about for a while.